Welcome to the General Resonance Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a discussion with Kent Lachlan on time consciousness. We now join this talk already in progress. The two major theories, the two major theories of consciousness that are again in that adversarial collaboration at the moment, IIT and GNWT, Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, only deal with time at sort of the entry point consciousness so it's all about functional integration and then maybe broadcasting or um, what has the highest um, phi peak at the time so in response to to stimuli often and what we're trying to say is you actually need to expand it out over multiple ignitions multiple um, phis in order to get a sense of phenomenological experience so so what is hey, the, um, uh, oh Sorry, Stephen, you can go. So what is the main experimental evidence for this one to three second uh, range of your um, um, ex extended consciousness? A, a lot of it's behavioral. A lot of it's how we mm -hmm. um, synchronize movements. It's a lot of it's how we interact with other people, how we vocalize, how we pass phrases into you know, one, one to three seconds. That's, that's definitely not a settled question. There's a lot of people, a good paper came out no infinite window seconds, but even in the way people process or perceive time, there is a, a bump at around one and a half seconds that says that after one and a half seconds, it's like there's a resetting of the temporal window. So that, that, that's almost an argument for saying it's discrete, that you have uh, a point at which you say, okay, I'll close off that present moment and move to the next. And I think there are pathological states where you could say that's what actually happens for some people, that there is a discrete boundary between, you know, the continuity of events, but in, especially in flow states where there's, where people are immersed in activity, I think we're, we're showing that there's, there's definitely no discrete break that people are able to move between representations very smoothly. So would you, be able, should you, would you be able to see this range in like in, in ERP, for example, and say, okay, this is your window of consciousness? So it's more about um, spontaneous activity. Mm -hmm. So the dy dynamics of spontaneous activity. So it's about spectral analyses of okay. autocorrelation windows and power spectra analyses. That's the neurological evidence for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I had a, a question. So you're kind of assigning consciousness to this middle time frame. Maybe that's like a uh, just feels right to you or something. Uh, but I'm just curious if there is any like quantitative or even qualitative differences between these three different modes. It seems like they all involve a brain network and a time scale for integrating information, and maybe they feed into each other hierarchically in some way but yeah i'm just curious like they, they seem to each be comprised of the same units and mechanisms like is there is there really anything that differentiates them in particular the center one as sort of being the one associated with consciousness yeah so you've got within experience you've got things like post-dictive effect, effects so you can have a, a stimulus that's perceived and even integrated here at the, the beginning of consciousness, so at the ERP level, but then due to information that it receives later, it gets updated and changed. So a post-dictive effect for us is evidence not of, you know, absolute discrete window activity here, but of continuous integration of co-conscious events here. So that's saying that there's definitely a change. Once something has been synchronized, there's further processing that happens. But the anterior insular, I think, is the point. That's a, like a central hub. So that's a central node in the network for creating a sense of synchrony. Beyond that, it needs to be fed forward into you know, higher nodes in the network. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, to some degree. Yeah, so you're kind of relying on like the functional properties of the different regions. Yeah, I, yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm still, I guess I'm not fully convinced that there's anything special about that one time scale. 
Yeah. Mm. But I, yeah, but I, I, I like your, your use of, of functional regions and associations. I think that's cool. Uh, I, I think this is very functional. It might be evolutionary. It might be um, something that's baked in to the, the intrinsic neural time scales of the regions that we're seeing interact. So if you're thinking about um, like a predictive processing um, approach, if you've got bottom up and top down uh, processes happening simultaneously, there has to be a point at which they intersect and that intersection has to happen temporally as well. So if bottom up is fast time scale and top down is slower time scales in the hierarchy, they have to meet and interact at some point. And yeah, it, it's a good question. And I think even Mark Whitman says, I don't have an answer, a discrete answer for that, a final answer, but Georg Northoff, who's doing a lot of that common currency approach and he's all about autocorrelation windows. He's saying we, the, the challenge is to define within the neuroscience what these um, what this window is. So is your is your comment that it just seems like it's it's scale free. So therefore, to actually pin it down to one scale is is over overcooking it. Yeah, I think I think it just comes down to like I, I I do like your idea that you are tying neural activity to observable behavior or different like time scales that are salient to our experience. Which yeah, on some yeah. level, that's all we can really ground it to at the phenomenological level um so yeah I, I i like your thought process yeah i'm just thinking like biologically is there anything mm. in particular that would like make that conscious versus the other one's not conscious and and, and maybe maybe it's just not there yet but I, yeah I, I do like the uh intersection point of the of the flowing scales but yeah in, yeah interesting <laughs> I, I don't expect you to have an answer, but <laughs> but I'm I'm still formulating that answer, and I think mm -hmm. um, so for depression, if we're saying that's the shift in the hierarchy, I think maybe you've got to look at the hierarchy as a whole in order to to figure that out. To say, well, there's probably a logarithmic um, time scale pattern underneath it, and if you can explain the whole thing, um, not just function but also experience, emotion. Uh, different aspects of experience and cognition within one model, then that's that's the proof. Not just, okay, we've isolated one thing and this is what we're going to point to as just that one window. So Mark and I actually differ on whether this is there's only one window of conscious experience. He says, yes, that this is this is consciousness. I disagree and say, well, actually, there's multiple windows of conscious experience. And in order to point to this one, you need to show those ones within the nested hierarchy. But I, I can get to that later. If I can just kind of key up that for a second, um, I'm finishing up right now Mark Stolm's really good new book called The Hidden Spring, which is um, his take on a lot of key questions in consciousness. And it kind of takes off on Panksepp's work. He's also Neo Freudian, pretty interesting stuff. But he argues it makes a good case for what I think is, you know, a pretty compelling view that the reason this, you know, extended moment, experience moment is so important is natural selection, right? Mm -hmm. Survival and reproduction. That's why it's, you know, the present moment and why it's got a special place in our, our own, you know, experiences. It's how we actually got here. Mm -hmm. um, does that help answer your, your question, Justin, or is it, are you looking at a different question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I get the associations and stuff like that. I, yeah, I guess uh, I'm curious if there's any mechanism or like grounded reason for this one being conscious and not the other. I think, I think yeah, Lachlan, your most recent answer, if maybe there's multiple windows, I think is what I was pushing for, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got there, you got me there, that's it. I got you there, but yeah, I, I don't know. I. But, but we have such a, a profound experience of being one person. So like mm. as much as it, it's like more scientifically sound to have a multitude of windows every day, I, I don't know, like me and Jonathan are working on this, this theory with like nested windows, maybe nested conscious beings inside of us. 
but you know when I'm lying in bed going to sleep it's like I still feel like I'm one person and it's mm -hmm. like is it all just uh philosophical musings and like I'm scientifically motivated to view myself as a multi-self but like experientially it's just so hard to get outside of the the singularness or the wholeness of it yeah but so you're talking about like self-consciousness there and that gets that's where it gets really tricky because like phenomenal consciousness excess consciousness self-consciousness are viewed very differently in the science and IIT and Global Neuronal Workspace just want to talk about phenomenal consciousness. Leave the self, leave access. Well, access is kind of buried in there for Global Neuronal Workspace, but the way that it's pitched is on um, aspects of phenomenal consciousness. So the whole grounding of what, what is the self and when does the self come in, into the picture, I think that's over time scale as well. That takes a certain amount of time to create a sense of self i don't think we're born or conceived with a sense of self so um, there's some good work being done by uh, a lady called anna chionica who's working on co-embodiment co-homeostasis and the basis of self-consciousness in others in utero so we need to we need feedback from basically our mother to give us a representation of ourself that's to me, that's fascinating work because that sort of bridges that gap between the personal and the impersonal or the non-personal. So the, that sort of makes the bridge towards evolutionary time scales. So that, that's where that nestedness comes in. I think different windows, different processes. This is just phenomenal consciousness. Make sense? Okay. Loose answer. All right, so really who cares about whether time consciousness is extended or not? And this is the um, adv adversarial collaboration I was talking about. So Global Neuronal Workspace versus IIT. IIT imagines a, so you can see it's time generalized decoding matrices. So there's timing in here, it's about synchronization. So Global Neuronal Workspace imagines that there's a burst of activity you know, between 300 and 1500 milliseconds after the onset of a stimulus, whereas IIT will have a continuous um, unfolding of uh, neural activity in the posterior cortical hot zone. And that's what they're pitching as their neural correlates of consciousness. And we'll get the data on that, I'm pretty sure in the next, in the next year or two. And surprise, surprise, this one will be, I think will be about report. So this will be about something more like uh, access consciousness, whereas this one will be more about uh, phenomenal, the phenomenal experience itself. But the fact that it's set up adversarial is interesting um, and gives us at least a, a vehicle to say time is important if you want to differentiate these theories. Didn't Sinoni write a paper saying that uh, consciousness was in visual cortex or something? <laughs> Early on, I think, maybe, maybe anyways, to, be, to be provocative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how this resolves. Yeah. There's a, um, another paper in the special issue in the neuros neuroscience of consciousness about how to do uh, theory comparison and not adversarially, but actually to compare and decide which one explains uh, what type of experiments better. And that's Simon Vandal Pin. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend reading that if you're interested in the, the comparison of theories. That's really good. Did I give, sorry, I got maybe a bit sidetracked by the, um, the question. Did I give enough uh, context on the paper itself? Or do you want me to go back over that a little bit more? What do you think? I think you're good. Go back, go, keep going. Okay. Yeah. We have a half an hour left, so. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm collaborating now with this guy, Georg Northoff. Um, he's got a temporospatial theory of consciousness, the TTC. So he is, again, much more interested in um, continuous activity, looking at different frequencies, also different areas. So he's not just saying it's one part of the brain, it's a whole brain uh, phenomenon. And... He's obviously very critical of this approach, doesn't think it'll amount to anything in terms of 
a fundamental theory, but I, I really like his approach. And it's, for me, it's about um, spontaneous activity. That's the, that's the key. So it's not just um, the timing of events, it's the spontaneous activity of the brain, spontaneous temporal activity, and how that dynamically interacts with the timing of stimuli. So if you have stimuli that are onset in phase or out of phase with that dynamical activity, they get processed differently. So that's highly relevant for general resonance theory because it's about the ability of stimuli to interact with uh, spontaneous activity. So that's a nice way of, it's a dynamical approach. I don't believe, um, IIT and Global Neuronal Workspace are dynamic enough, nor are they extended enough. So here you've got timescales of um, 300 to 1500 milliseconds. Again, I don't think that's extended enough in terms of what we would consider to be a single conscious experience, not just a serial unfolding of different events, but what we would count as one event. Yeah, they both seem entirely timeless to me and just totally static, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the point in the paper was that time is static, discrete, too short, unextended and non-dynamic. Non so there's a, there's a word called diachronic um, time. So these theories are very synchronic. So it's all about the synchrony of um, neural activity at the time or just after the stimulus. Whereas you need to look diachronically, you need to look at multiple windows in order to get a real sense of what's happening and including pre-stimulus activity. There's no um, consideration given what was the brain doing before that stimulus hit. It's just, okay, now we're measuring from here, but surely that pre-stimulus activity has something to do with it. That spontaneous activity, that's not stimulus dependent. So that's where I, I much prefer Georg's approach and he is in, in dialogue now with people from IIT, taking a mathematical approach, looking at category theory and different, um, different backgrounding approaches to try and get people on board and also looking at predictive processing. So he has spoken with Carl Friston about it. So they're probably gonna work on a paper at some point looking at free energy as a way of harnessing time in a sense. So I'm probably going to pivot away from the paper here at this point. Do we want to talk about the paper at all more? Or do you want me to go on with some more of my other work? I do have one question there. And I think Colin, I want to jump in too, is that you do uh, make some statements in the paper that struck me as a bit too categorical, including uh, statements like the all theories of consciousness, et cetera. And then I think you acknowledge in the brief intro as we did where Colin mentioned this point that that's just in relation to eight theories that were covered in that particular paper. So I guess my question for you is, when you're looking at a bit more broadly, um, what theories or approaches do you think are a bit more on the right track in terms of incorporating a more, um, a more ontological basis for time into the theory? Not being you know, hugely au fait with uh, EM theories, but I'll, I'll take your point that if there is a... Um, a basis there for time to be dynamically unfolding, to be extended and resonance for me is very similar to Georg's approach, dynamical approach. So yeah, I think I'm only, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new to consciousness science in a way and looking at it a little bit naively. So I'm yeah, open to the dialogue about what what theories are out there because I really don't I really don't know. The, I'm basically looking at the the theories that are circulating a lot at the moment, and to me the the bias in the field is towards is towards short, discrete, non dynamic. So yeah, agreed. Yeah. That's certainly the general the general view, and certainly one that I think we would agree is probably not going to be the place we land as a community of scholars, but we'll see. Um, and I guess Colin is hoping to set you up there for your questions. Yeah, I just got one that hit me. It was in this class of um, sort of a, a unitary ex, uh, pronouncement, um, which I find just kind of baffling when my eyes hit it. Mm. Um, page seven on remedies to shortcomings of theories of consciousness. There's a statement which goes along the lines of, um, 
the main advantage of studies into time consciousness over other methodological approaches is that whereas qualia are not at all instantiated in neural activity, e.g. neurons need not recreate the color red in a Cartesian theater, time is. Now, that statement, qualia not at all instantiated in neural activity, just goes bang in my brain. Like, there's nothing else there but neurons. Mm. Uh, and a Cartesian theater, if there is one in a brain, is made of neuro neuronal behavior. Mm. The, the claim that it's not at all. Now, then I try and say, okay, they've made a typo. Leave the word at out. Uh, qualia are not all instantiated in neural activity it has a similar problem. So I just wondered if you could actually flesh out briefly how that statement can be made given that a brain is entirely made of neurons and glia yeah. um, and the other miscellany that goes on in there. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. So it's basically to say that we experience the color red, but the brain doesn't create the color red. Okay. Red. No, or I think we're in the middle of a, the, one of the fundamental um, issues down deep in the problems that have been experienced in the past. The, the concept of redness isn't in nature. Like the flower itself is not red. There's no such thing as red. Uh, and the idea is that our brain is painting the rose red from a palette of qualia. And, uh, the thing that is actually doing that, th there's nothing else there that can be doing that except neuronal activity. Now, I don't know what um, super added uh, physics is involved in excess of what's actually in the brain uh, to cause a redness experience to happen. But being neurons delivers that very thing. The, uh, the painting of the palette of colors into the visual uh, scene is done by neurons and we know exactly where it happens in V4. Mm -hmm. So I'm having that, that statement seems at odds with everything I know about the origins of subjective experiences. So is it the I'm word just going to leave that there. <laughs> is it the word instantiated that, uh, that, sort of causes that adverse, that adverse reaction because what i meant by instantiated is you see uh, a tree but the the brain doesn't have to create a tree-like form in its brain in neural activity okay. it can it can code it yeah there clearly i can see we need to talk later on, but if you can imagine the world outside, let's just focus for the minute of, on mm. uh, visual experience. The world outside is a, a colorless, featureless, blank palette of space with stuff in it, which whose locations in space are innate and the, somehow we're interacting with that structure. Mm. And then there is a, a, an artist in our head who's from multiple sites simultaneously, more than one artist, a hundred artists, simultaneously coloring in everything in real time or close to real time. Um, then we're going to end up in a, in a bit of a discussion about who the artist is and what the palette is and whether the palette is actually in the, the, the uh, natural world or not. And that's a discussion which we could have, but I think it would uh, take over this whole thing and I don't really want to go into it, but if you can imagine that, issue when i run across a sentence like that i'm just pointing to my notes here hmm. um i i had real trouble i could not make it make sense of it from my perspective which is really interesting yeah because i i haven't come across so clearly your head's in somewhere and i want to find out where that is okay that's gonna take a while <laughs> rather okay rather than talk about the world out there should we talk yeah. about the activity of the retina the retina receives there's red blue and green light cones is that right yeah yeah so the, the red light cone responds to a certain frequency range of light yeah but that activity from the retina gets transcoded in the visual cortex yeah so it's no longer 
in once it's in the visual cortex, it's no longer responsive to that wavelength of light. Well, there's a whole lot of timing issues to do with the decoding and the transmission right through all of the various pathways into the back of the brain. We don't actually see with retina, we see with the brain, the, the, the back of the retina is where it's happening. The back of the, so the sorry, back of the cortex back here is where it is erected. We don't see with our eyes at all. Exactly. So, so the, fact that you've, the fact that you've appealed to time to make sense of that transcoding yeah. is the point that I'm making. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm right on board with the whole time thing. Uh, that, that's great. You know, the, the chips that I want to build time, the timing and the elbowing out of various simultaneous processes within um, a sort of overarching time scale um, is central to the operation of these chips. So mm. um, we've got from an empirical standpoint, there's a future in this for the examination of time in, in consciousness. So, um, but so the, the actual mechanisms, I, I've actually got a mechanism for generating a redness experience. So it's, and I know where it happens in neurons. Yeah. So, um, so reading a sentence like that is troublesome for me. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I think we can, I think we can find a common point. The, the distinction I'm making is that we do experience time. It's a, that is a conscious experience as well, as well yeah. as being the basis for experience. Yeah. We can also reflect on it and experience time. So there, there is a timeness, a like there's a redness, there's a timeness. Yeah. Very hard to articulate as usual, but there is one. Yeah, I'm on board with that as well. So we call that time perception. And yeah. that's something that we're creating at a level above the concrete objects that we're either yeah. interocepting or exterocepting. Yeah. So that is an inherent property of the brain. Yeah, the redness is at least in reference to something external. External, yeah, it's internal. It has the same uh, status in terms of information presentation as an emotion. Um, the very different qualia, like sadness, is not the same as happiness, whatever. And now, if we add timeness to that palette, it's it's kind of like uh, it, it fits into the same category as emotion. Mm. It's it's universal floods everything that is you from all directions at once it's omnidirectional or isotropic and homogenous you know it's the same in every direction as it's well as being same everywhere you take it with you as mm. you go it's a temp it's the temporal field for lower level conscious contents yeah it's, Can I it's interject real quick? um yeah so i find all this really fascinating and, and lachlan i think your work is amazing and I want to just um, highlight, we actually did uh, review in our, in the same forum, uh, a paper recently by Buzaki, I think 2003, where they did a broad comparison across about a hundred different mammal species of what we call the resonome, just looking at the EM field um, frequencies that predominate uh, in various mammal brain. And they found kind of surprisingly uh, that the EM field frequency bands were conserved pretty remarkably across species from shrews to elephants. Uh, there are, of course, differences, but the real remarkable finding was that there's not much difference across all these mammal species. Mm. And I'm wondering if you had thought yet about looking to EM field frequency bands and their conservation as a basis for time consciousness um, and also in terms of dilation or um, speeding up. Mm. Uh, there's certainly some empirical work been done there already that those frequency bands can shift a bit in individuals over time. So what do you think about that as kind of a fruitful area to you know, follow up with your work? Oh, very, very open to it. And I would need to just make the connection between EEG frequency, which I understand and how that's structured and EM field frequency. What's the what's the I'm using the terms interchangeably. Yeah. So EM fields, of course, being measured by EEG, MEG, other things. EEG is the most common, but mm. EEG is looking on electrical fields, right? Whereas the EM field phenomenon is a more complete description of what's going on. Yeah. I, I all think electromagnetism. Yeah. A whole lot. Yeah. 
100% open to it. And I think that very closely aligns with uh, Northoff's temporospatial theory of consciousness, to be honest. So that's around um, EEG spectra. So if there's going to be an EM analog of that, then I think it's going to talk the same the same language. <laughs> Was that only in um, in mammal species that the... It looked at mammals only, and I don't yeah. know if the conservation goes across other species. I imagine it probably does to some degree, probably to fishes and birds, I'm guessing, to some degree. I don't know that insects have any recognisable equivalent right. to what we see as an EEG, but there's some resonance processes <laughs> in there, clearly. Um, mm -hmm. They're just too yeah. small to express. We did, the we did look at one paper recently with um, Asa Young, being first author at um, um, cephalopod um, EEG. And mm -hmm. I don't know to the, to, right now to what degree um, octopi or squid EEG shows the same frequency bands. Asa, do you know off, offhand if there's any uh, conservation across those EEG bands you know, between mammals and cephalopods? They have multiple he, brains, though, don't they? I think he left the chat yeah. a little, a little yeah. bit ago. Yeah, oh, leave. Okay, okay, no he Disappeared. Yeah. Well, yeah. So sorry, Lachlan. Um, please, in the last fifteen minutes, uh, you know, go on what you had uh, planned to present. Okay. Oh wait, um, I have three quick comments on the paper. If that's okay. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Awesome. Um, so in terms of, uh, it, was, it was interesting to hear that schizophrenia is one of your areas of focus because uh, there was a comment in the paper about how, um, you know, perception of time for schizophrenics is, is very different. And then there was a, a comment later that, um, you know, an increased sense of awareness of self and particularly like the autobiographical self um, correlates with an uh, increase in awareness of time. And that totally makes sense uh, from the perspective of schizophrenics because you have, um, you know, this very different sense of the self other boundary. And so it, it makes sense, you know, given that, that the, the sense of time would also be very distorted. Um, so that's cool. Um, another thing, so there was a reference to um, Picard and Craig and their uh, frame rate for the continuous bodily signals at, at about eight hertz. And uh, one, one of my favorite guys is uh, Michael Persinger, late uh, professor at Laurentian University. And he talks about how, yeah, the, um, so the first harmonic of uh, the Schumann resonance is also matched to the rostral caudal sort of waves that, that go across the, the cortex and also Interestingly, uh, the amount of time it takes to add a base to DNA. So. Yeah, really? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's I good. know. Isn't that cool? Yeah. 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 So anyway, that and then um, final thing. So uh, I thought it was interesting because most um, sort of discussions of time either kind of fall into one of two camps. It's either um, presentism, you know, where where everything happens in the now or um, eternalism. So like the block of time and past, present, future, you know, all equally viable. Mm. It's almost like you kind of take the superposition on the two where, mm. you know, uh, the basis of a lot of your paper is James and Herschel's kind of temporal field from which all these events sort of unfold. But at the same time you take offense, you know, to something like consciousness is a snapshot of time. So I, I thought that was really interesting. So McTaggart, the original, I think he was an Irish philosopher back in the early uh, 20th century. So yeah. he came up with the idea of the A series and the B series. So the A series is presentism, B series is eternalism, is block world. Mm -hmm. And he even talked himself out, he goes, no, neither of these are sufficient. So he proposed yeah. something called a C series, which is like the consciousness series because there are multiple c series one for each observer so he, he even toyed with the idea of well there has to be something that superposes both of those to explain mm -hmm. either of them so mm -hmm. he was even toying with you know a, a different approach and that's i think that's where we have to get to somehow and i think part of that is reconciling physical and subjective time absolutely under, a, under the same framework yeah so yeah transcendent function kind of yeah. The, the stuff with schizophrenia, it's it's not around, again, it's a bit um, different to depression. It's not around um, sort of presence or orientation to time. It's very much around temporal processing of stimuli. 
and it's even more fine grained than that. There's a, a good meta analysis by Tones on T H O N E S. I think it's Tones and Oberfeld. They did a two meta analyses, one of depression, one of schizophrenia, and it's it's simply around the precision of temporal processing in schizophrenia that's at issue not the accuracy not whether overall they're accurate in a sort of macro sense but how precise they are there's more standard deviation in their responses so that's in an argument to say that um, makes a that's the source of the problem in relating to the external world that there's no consistent external referent that's being targeted that they're kind of all over the place yeah, I, I have a cousin with schizophrenia and uh, his sense of time is very nonlinear. So, mm, yeah. yeah. And Chunky. by the way, if we ever need a, a schizophrenic to like scan for any studies, like he's, he's up for that. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, so how does, uh, so what do you mean by a sense of time that's nonlinear? Like, what does that manifest as? Oh, oh. describe it. It's, yeah, dude, it, it's Sorry. tough to rely on him sometimes for for certain things. You know, he's kind of all over the place. And and um, yeah, I, probably very similar to certain psychedelic experiences where you kind of pop into like a memory and then like present moment awareness and then some of it. You know, you kind of yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think I think that's what he's dealing with on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's no linear projection of moment yeah. after moment after moment. They'll take yeah. a trip from, you know, the rapid series of now to, no, I'll just go into like a daydreaming state up here and lose time for a second and then and then pop back into now, now, now and then right. and take a trip out. Yeah. yeah. What, that, yeah. What, what that reminds me of fully is, is like the P50 gating and, and the sensory processing that's so early uh, that you see in like prodromal symptoms and mm. even relatives of schizophrenics that, that like it really is tied to time, but in a different way. And maybe it's mm. downstream, like because it's so early on and it's so fundamental to the sensory system with P50 gating, for example, it's like there's no novelty. There's mm. no like because everything there's no, uh, you know, filtering of, and, and so if there's like this sense of recognition of, of even like chunking things within that window, maybe that is like, you know, one second to something like, maybe there's something to that that's more linked to how we integrate and then therefore over the course of many, you know, years or decades, perhaps like start to like, it, it breaks at some point where it's really linked to time or mm -hmm. the process of time. So mismatch negativity is almost diagnostic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Ex exactly. Um, P50 and and mismatch and MMN. Um, yeah, absolutely. And something called the temporal integration window. Mm -hmm. So there's some good work by Anne Giersch and Bryce Martin around a longer window of now in schizophrenia that it's yep. just expanded. They don't have a uh, a concise um, synchrony of present moment mm. yeah cool should i keep going sure okay so the work that i'm doing now is around the extension of time consciousness but sort of the radical extension of time consciousness so talking about real-time processes versus evolutionary time so i don't think we're going to be able to explain conscious experience in the here and now without explaining where it came from and how that nested experience from other people actually feeds back into ours so phenomenal consciousness happens in the here and now what we loosely call real time so real time contrast with things that from our typical lived time scale of seconds hours and days are not happening here and now but we would sort of project them and say they happen over decades or millennia or millions of years what we would call intergenerational or evolutionary time or even cosmological time but the problem, as we've said many times, of the neuroscience of consciousness is it's effectively or almost exclusively constrained to real-time processes and neural theories of phenomenal consciousness that only really deal with a few hundred milliseconds. So again, the adversarial collaboration. So in general resonance theory, so um, just a quote, so this allows for significantly higher bandwidth and speed and energy and information flows between the constitu constituents of whatever resonating structure we're looking at. So the resonating structure for me is 
that nested hierarchy. So the resonating waveforms of the microconscious entities are then coherent and information flows combine into a large entity, a larger harmonic rather than occurring out of phase. And so that resonating structure I would call a nest. Sorry, so can, I, can I can I um, just ask a question there? Yeah. Back up your slide real quick. Yeah. So just to, to be clear on the point, so you're calling this a nest as a conceptual structure. You're saying mm -hmm. this kind of resonating structure you're saying is a generic label. You're calling it a nest. I can yeah, help right. with that. In hierarchy theory, there's two ways of describing things. The, the, the formal way is a containment hierarchy. And that's usually where, where each layer is built on the, the layers underneath. And that's called nesting. Mm -hmm. So that's what the nest is actually referring to. Okay. Yeah, and I was just, I was just asking quickly about Lachlan's uh, nomenclature. And I definitely like that. And I wanted to kind of just analogize it to uh, Kessler's Holon um, approach, yeah. where, of course, Holons are basically open, you know, upwards and downwards. And they're both parts and whole simultaneously. So would you say a nest in this case in your conceptual structure is similar to a holon? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So cool. yeah, not necessarily knowing what a, a holon is strictly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. sounds about right. But I would say it's not just a conceptual structure that the brain is actually structured this way. The mm -hmm. brain is a, a nested time scale organ. Agreed. Thank okay. you. So let's go back to Zeki. If we're talking about it, the phenomenal level, you've got micro consciousness of phenomenal contents. So that's a, a picture from Zeki's and Overgaard, 2016. So dimensions of conscious state, so intensity, precision, and also levels um, uh, of representation. Then let's talk about creature consciousness. So from Bain, Hovey and Owen uh, a few years ago, taxonomy of disorders of consciousness. So we're talking about global states of consciousness here, and I would align that with Zeki macro states. But let's go to the evolutionary and talk about animal consciousness. So, you know, different species, so dimensions of animal consciousness. Uh, it's Birch et al. I think one of them might have been Hovey as well. Well, um, so certain, there are certain innate properties of consciousness. So I think this even goes beyond what Zeki's talking about in terms of unified. This is about interpersonal and evolutionary consciousness. So they have typical dynamical timescale ranges for phenomenal consciousness that acts on the, say, the milliseconds to seconds range. But creature consciousness, so we're talking about um, consciousness in sort of the medical terms, so whether people are aware um, while under anesthesia that tends to occur over hours, days, and months, and also our sleep. So that has a certain temporal uh, rhythm to it. But then animal consciousness only really changes over, say, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So that's the dynamical timescale range. So my question is, how, how does the narrow focus on real time limit our understanding of consciousness? And how could we expand our view to grapple with the evolution of different animal consciousness over extended nested or resonant timescales? So if we talk about temporal nestedness, real-time real neural processes associated with phenomenal consciousness are nested within processes occurring over evolutionary time. So in other words, the relatively short dynamical timescale range of phenomenal consciousness is connected to that relatively long dynamical timescale range of animal consciousness. But how? So I think Tammy would say through resonance. I would say the same through uh, nestedness, but along a temporal continuum of conscious states. So you've got phenomenal creature and animal uh, at sort of the extremes and sort of one in the middle, but I think you can uh, flesh it out even further to say you've got uh, self-consciousness. So being a reflective conscious agent, um, as you are saying, that that's something that we can't deny people in dissociative states or, you know, um, multiple, uh, uh, multiple identity states, they would say that, that that's not a comfortable uh, state to be in of having multiple selves. Um, so that lasts a certain time scale as well. That lasts a lifetime. And then within that, you've got intergenerational basis of consciousness. So that first prior, that paper I was talking about, Anna Chionica, talking about co-embodiment and the basis of uh a conscious self that comes from someone else from relating to the external world of the mother's uh, mother's womb. 
that's in a predictive processing uh, uh, language, but I think the, the principle still, still holds. And then this is what we mean by nestedness, that you've got phenomenal creature, self, intergenerational, and animal consciousness all nested. And to experience, say, what it's like to be a bat in Nagel's terminology, they all have to be instantiated together. So they all have to be happening at the same time. They have to be present together. So the paper that I'm working on at the moment that's under review is taking this time scale uh, nested hierarchy and turning it on its side. So there's actually um, two time scales. So you've got a um, along along the bottom, you've got a time scale that we were talking about before of seconds, hours, months, centuries, um, thousands of years, and that's what's tracking that nest we're talking about. But then the vertical time scale is around sort of the evolutionary processes that are happening there. So you've got real time developmental time, intergenerational time and evolutionary time. And within that, so you can analogize and talk about different cognitive in, uh, intelligence processes, emotional intelligence processes, having sort of typical timescale ranges of activity. And so it's based on a paper from 2019 that we published that was just the smaller version of that hierarchy and really just talking about three ver three forms of conscious experience. So phenomenal, the wakefulness, which is creature consciousness and self-consciousness, how that forms a the basis for our hierarchy that we would also call intelligence or an, an emotional intelligence. So I think the challenge is to explain consciousness in real time. My feeling is we need to expand that narrow focus. I'm basically repeating myself a hundred times here. Um, not only include the timescales of personal conscious states, creature and self-consciousness, but also the interpersonal basis of conscious experience and the impersonal evolution of animal consciousness. So I think, yeah, to relate that back to general resonance theory, I think you know, there are, there's work being done in the predictive processing and free energy uh, realm as well to say that you have resonance encoded you know, genetically as well, that DNA and epigenetics, so intergenerational trauma changes epigenetics that changes the way the brain processes time, that you've got a biological basis also for uh, time being encoded or experience, you know, historical and evolutionary experience being encoded in genetics and epigenetics. So I think that's what we're gonna need to grapple with to understand pathological states but also non-pathological states of consciousness, whether that's stimulus-based, you know, uh, processing of um, environmental stimuli, interoceptive bases, or the sort of spontaneous activity, which I think is more, that's, that's a better candidate in terms of space and time. That's, that's all I had. Oh, no, talking about uh, resonance, um, so out of, the, out of the paper, you talked about faster resonance speed is what leads to larger and more complex uh, conscious entities. And I wondered as a point of a discussion, does slower resonance also give you more simple but more powerful consciousness? Is it a slower resonance um, similar to slower EEG uh, profiles that are associated with the loss of consciousness? Um, and then sort of harking back to general relativity stuff, what about acceleration? What about changes in the speed of resonance? Is that greater dynamical range of consciousness? So from personal to impersonal. And that's where I think general relativity would come in because it's about acceleration. Gravity is you know, an acceleration field on the basis of mass and energy. So I, th I think there's a way to talk about the changes in speed of resonance as well but that was just a point of uh, like a springboard for conversation as well yeah well thank we're you probably running out of time we are out of time yeah so i won't actually even attempt to answer your really interesting questions i don't think i have a very good answer right now uh but you know what i want to just say thank you so much and um no maybe take one final question from someone else but i want to also just put out that we'd love to have you back i think there's a lot more to talk about here so yeah. I'll certainly be in touch with you later about maybe a second presentation, but maybe sure. I don't want to ask you a final question before we wrap up. Too hard. <laughs> <laughs>
Any, any easy questions here? <laughs> Blade no, exploding. Right. We'll, leave, we'll leave it at that then. <laughs> On behalf of the entire General Residence Theory team, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, share it, add a comment, and subscribe for more content. We'll see you next time. Welcome to the General Residence Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a discussion with Kent Lachlan on time consciousness. We now join this talk already in progress.